it's my pleasure to welcome um i don't know how to uh, connect you to what category are you classic are you 212 just a bodybuilding competitor santi i'm a hybrid <laughs> you're a hybrid both of them but uh, yeah you're five weeks out how is it done it's good, man. I mean, the transition from classic to 212 is always very interesting because I only think that a handful of the top uh, classic guys can actually do it. Um, you know, we have Keon this year that's, that's doing – or he's going to be competing next year, but he started doing that transition this year. We got George Pearson that's also doing it uh, this year. I'll be going up against him in Tampa – and uh, there's only a handful of us that, that could actually make that transition and I think do it, do it successfully. So it's, it's a completely different ball game from many aspects. Uh, one being the training. The training is completely different in my opinion just because now you, uh, you, you can't limit yourself on size, at least me. In classic, I had to limit myself on size. So training was always affected by the amount of food that I was actually taking in. And because making that weight always made it increasingly hard every single year, you would have to eat less food and therefore your training would suffer. So training is at its all time high, even five weeks out. And it feels like I'm in an off season almost. And, um, you know, food as well, food, the amount of food that I'm eating right now, five weeks out, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty scary because I've never been in this territory before where I'm eating so much goddamn food. Um, I'm not complaining, but it, it's, it's definitely, you know, it, it's a little bit, if you're so used to not eating to get ready for a show, and then now you're eating almost like the amount of calories that you would do at the highest point of your off season and you're five weeks out, it's, it's a little strange. Um, and then obviously, I don't know if you, if you touch on, on, um, on, you know, supplements, here on your on your page yeah, but I do I do I do you can yeah, but, but the the supplement protocols are are much different in 212 versus classic you know I was always very open on my social media about the the gear that I use just to mostly to educate people because especially guys that are you know 30 and under that's usually what my demographic is of my following um, I didn't really have the opportunity to get, to get a lot of information when I first started, just because the internet wasn't very vast, uh, pros were unaccessible and, and you kind of had to figure things out yourself. So now with social media, you know, there, you have a select few pros that are willing to tell you what they do. And it just should open up the eyes to amateurs and people that are first starting to be like, I don't really have to take that much. It, it's really you really have to concentrate on your training. You really have to concentrate on sleep and your diet. And then everything else, once you have those in play, you know, the, the gear really helps. But if you don't have those basic building blocks, I don't care how much gear you take. I mean, you would know that when you hear some of these people at the gym, some of the gear protocols that they're taking, you're like, dude, you're taking triple the amount of me and, I, and you look nowhere near like what you should be at that amount. And it all comes down to the diet and, and the training. So, uh, um, you know, the, the 212 protocol that I'm doing right now, it's, it's, it's not vastly different, but obviously like the gear, the gear is, is a little bit more than what I would usually take for classic. Yeah. I, as I was following you, you used to stop the testosterone, for example, for, uh, like five weeks out and so on. Yeah. Like, right. Like my update this week, we pulled testosterone already. Oh, already we completely pulled it out. It's just that I've, it, this is, doesn't work for everybody, but I've already worked with uh, my coach, Andrew Vu, for so long that he knows already, like, what happens when we do this and how long can we get away with doing something or pulling it out, etc. So it wouldn't be something that I would maybe put one of my clients through just because it's so drastic, you know, to pull it out completely. But since we've done it so many times already, he knows exactly, like, we, we know what to expect. When speaking about the people that are transitioning, let's first start with something positive. A uh, yeah. good guy from Poland, I know that you conversed with him, uh, Piotr Borecki. He's also mm -hmm. uh, trans, uh, transferring to the 212. Do you think that's a good idea for him? I think so. I think, I think that, I think most classic guys, once they hit a cap on the weight, then 
it's you lose that love for bodybuilding in general because bodybuilding the essence is trying to trying to improve a little bit every single year and every time that you're on stage and once you hit that max weight there's not really anything else you can do the only the only solution if you're ready maxing yourself out is to literally downsize yourself and then reinvent your physique again whether like for instance he's he uh he has a harder time building a full set of legs because he has such an overpowering upper body now if he were to then say you know what i'm gonna stay in classic he would have to train to downsize his upper body to fill out his legs so that weight you know distributes the correct way now in 212 he could train the way that he wants. He could keep that upper body and then go ahead and train those legs and build those legs to match that overpowering upper body that he has. So yeah. it, it's it, it, once the classic, you, you have to start, I feel like you have to start from the beginning and build a very balanced physique. Once that physique is a little bit unbalanced, it's really hard to reinvent yourself again, to, to make that weight class. Speaking about George Peterson, uh, he surely fits more to the to 12. Do you see him in the future in the open bodybuilding? Ah, it's hard to say. It's, it's hard because, I mean, just looking at his prep, I, I, I follow his, uh, his prep and looking at his prep five weeks out, he's already like at like two, he's still at like 230. Yeah. And, he's, and he's pretty damn, you know, in really great shape. So I think that maybe he'll, he'll, he'll have to jump after like two years. You know, he just has a body that just want, it obviously wants to grow. And, uh, and I think that he's not, uh, he's obviously, he's not getting any younger. So if he, if he continues to just kind of create a ceiling on his physique, it, I think that it'll hurt him in the future because age is not going to be on his side. Yeah, and when jumping to another category, <laughs> uh, I, uh, your opinion about Flex Lewis? Can he win the Olympia? I, have you just seen his photos? Because yeah, uh, yeah. the it's insane. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that he's going to be very competitive. I'd love to see him uh, standing next to like a hottie Chopin, um, you know, just battling it out, not having to make a weight class or anything like that. And they, you know, they've battled it out in the past already. So it'd be nice to see what it looks like without having a, a, a weight cap, fully carved up, fully dry, fully everything without any, any type of restrictions. Do I think that he can win the Olympia? No, no. And he's a friend of mine. Uh, Flex is a friend of mine. We are, we're, we both sponsored with Mega Fit Meals, but uh, I think that the, it's the height. It's the height disadvantage. Um, you know, I don't see anybody in the future, like for instance, in classic physique, a five-five guy, be uh, being able to beat somebody like a Chris Bumstead that you know s anybody standing six feet is just going to look so much more you know put together and aesthetic versus somebody that's more short and stubby. And you really see somebody's flaws as a shorter guy when you're actually standing next to somebody that's much taller. So I think that's that's the only downside with Flex is that he's on the shorter side. Coming back to uh, to the to 12 category, and uh, I don't like the drama, but uh, I think it's important to speak about it. Uh, the Keon situation, the whole thing uh, that he left uh, his coach and left the uh, Blackstone Labs. He's now with uh, HD team with uh, Dorian Hamilton. Yeah. And uh, it's quite... It's not really understandable to me. I know that you are uh, you uh, recorded a few times with Nick Trigidi. Trigidi? Mm -hmm. And uh, he has he had uh, his uh, opinion and he spoke to PJ, and it's kind of weird how how he acted. It's tough that. because because I have a, I have a couple opinions on that. the The first two opinions I have is first we live uh, we live here in the United States where everybody's entitled to their own opinion, regardless. You have to respect the fact that somebody's going to have a different point of view than you. Somebody is going to have different life experiences than you and that's probably why they came to the conclusion of whatever position that they may have on whatever issue um it's very important that when you when somebody has a different point of view that you try to relate to them maybe you don't agree with them but you try your best to understand that this is the way that they feel and you need to respect 
their point of view as you would respect my point of view. Now, now that we have that aside, I think it's very important that if you are the face of a company, if you are a CEO, you don't want to alienate and you don't want to uh, uh, put, put you know, a group of maybe people that are purchasing your products and segregate them you know, in a way that you're, you're, you're calling, the, it feels like you're getting called on. You know? So I think that when you're a CEO or you're a head of a company, staying out of politics is probably the best thing that you can do and just stay neutral right in the middle. And I think that that's, that's, the, that's the, the big responsibility that you have when you represent a, a group of people. I mean, he represents, PJ represents uh, not only his company, but he also represents the athletes as well. And also the followers that want to purchase his stuff because of who he is and, you know, and they love his brand and, and all of that. And they want to support him. But you also have to remember that 50% of the United States is not going to particularly agree with you. And that when you're a business owner, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So I think he made a mistake. I think he overstepped himself just in a CEO position. But I do think that whatever position that he did have on whatever he spoke about, he's entitled to his opinion. Keon is entitled to his opinion. He made a, a, a move, you know, to, to step away, which also PJ should, should respect because that's, his, again, his point of view, I understand. And, and that's that, you know. But, again, we, li we live in the United States where everybody, everybody has their own opinion. Everybody's entitled. But you have to be you have to be very responsible if you are going to uh, give your opinion on something. You got to get ready for some backlash. Uh, jumping a little bit uh, forward, uh, away from the bodybuilding, but not really away, but staying with the within the industry and CEOs and so on. You are uh, you have the Paragon the waist trainer. Yes. I want to ask you, how do they work? Do they work? I, I mean, of course, if they wouldn't, you wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> just wouldn't uh, promote them. But uh, how do they work? How often do we, should we wear it? And when should we wear it? Mm -hmm. now, I don't like, when it comes to niche products like this, I, I don't like to make any claims. I, I allow the customers to make the choice of purchasing it. And then their testimonials are the ones that are going to drive the product and I've only gotten because I used uh, before I created this brand I used to wear just the Amazon waist trainer I used to wear girl waist trainers and I noticed that two things at least for me this is me speaking from experience for, for me for my, uh, wearing the waist trainers before I created my brand was that I have very overpowering obliques to begin with so taking them out of the equation on any type of movements that were heavy was essential and that's what that's what i believe worked for me to help keep my keep my waist down now that's looking at me from the front so that my obliques didn't start bulging out so for me that's what worked the second thing that worked for me is it helped me really control my breathing it helped me keep keep my mind thinking about that i needed to start breathing more with my chest rather than my stomach and me eating so much food you know all these bodybuilders are eating so much food you see their gut hanging out and then that's just, that's just, you just forget. You, that's just a normal thing that you do. The waist trainer keeps you so tight in your core that now you're forcing your body now to chest breathe, which essentially now when I'm gassed out on stage or at the gym, now I'm, I'm, now I'm trained to, to uh, breathe with my chest rather than my stomach. And that's like one of the first things that, that people, when they're, when they're tired on stage, that's what happens. The, set, the, the last thing that it's helped me is my posture. I have absolutely terrible, horrible posture. And the first thing that I would do when I would get on the, uh, on the Stairmaster is I'd slouch over and hold the railings. That's the first thing most people do. Now the waist trainer forces you to stay upright. Again, now you're breathing with your chest. So it really makes, it really makes the cardio session that much more difficult when you're having all these, you know, uh, I mean, I would think that they're all positive, but it makes it a lot more challenging. Um, as far as how much I wear it, I don't do the whole thing that these girls wear them like for 24 hours, they wear their waist trainer and stuff like that. 
I wear mine during cardio and I wear mine during training. Those are the only two times. So a total, maybe two hours a day. So do you train with a belt as well or only the waist trainer? I do. I train, I train with the waist trainer, but on like, let's say like today I, I was pulling the five plates on rack deads. I put on my traditional Cardillo belt and then on my highest um, uh, point when I'm doing squats, I'll bring out the, uh, the belt as well. But any other, any other exercises that I'm doing, I have that waist trainer on. Are there any other tips that you would uh, advise to people to shrink your waist? Pretty much, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it is, is genetic. I think a lot of it's genetic. A lot of it is, is just, you know, um, digestion, you know, making sure that you eat foods that, that digest properly so that you don't always feel bloated. Um, but, I, you know, it's inevitable. It's inevitable when you're, when you're trying to gain size that it's, sometimes it's inevitable that your waist is going to follow everything else because, I mean, that's the base. That's, that's, that's the center of your body. So using these little tricks, even if they, even if they help 1%, 2%, 5%, when you're that low of body fat, 1% really makes a huge difference, really makes a huge difference. So right now we're, we're developing a, a, a topical cream that goes with the waist trainer as well. Um, and that's in the work. So hopefully by the end of the year, we have that coming out with the new version of the waist trainer. MHP had uh, had one like uh, one of this one of these those uh, creams. Yeah, the topical creams are great. I mean, I've used I use many different brands of topical creams. Um, you know, again, I don't make claims that oh, it's gonna shred your abdominal fat, but I will say that I look pretty peeled after my cardio session. Like yeah. my stomach is really dry after that. So uh, you know, it helps pull water. You know, it, it if some of these different types of creams they they, um, they promote um, blood flow to certain areas that maybe are, are cold for longer while you're doing cardio. So it speeds up the heating up process, you know, if you uh, put it on your glutes or you put it on your legs. But I've seen, I've seen great results with some of these creams. And hopefully, you know, the, the formula that I have coming with the waist trainer, they're just going to go right together. Uh, there is quite the uh, of argument. Is it because of GH and insulin or crazy amounts of food that makes uh, this, uh, that stomach graph? Which one of these do you think, or both? I think, I think it's a combination, but I really do believe mostly it's, it's the food. It's the food. I mean, um, like I'll, get, I'll give you an example. Like if just out of common sense, when I compete in, in a classic and I'm eating less food, my waist is much smaller than uh, measured wise than what it is if I do 212. And it just makes perfect sense. One is obviously I'm going to weigh more because I'm eating more, but then the, just the amount of food. I mean, it's inevitable that, that you're going to have some type of, uh, some type of distension or, or something just with the amount of food. That's why I always say that it's always very important that, that you, you, you find foods that work well for you. So, you know, when people talk about, oh, if it fits your macros and blah, 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 all this stuff, I'm like, no, 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 forget about if it fits your macros. Does it fit you? Okay. So if I put on your plan, you know, uh, I want you to eat 60 grams of carbs coming from this carb source and you experiment, experiment with it and you notice that, man, it's not settling in my stomach correctly. I'm not digesting it the way that I want. Start looking for something else that fits close to those macronutrients that, that those carbohydrates are and replace it with something else that works for you. And that, that's, that's basically what I've done. You know, this, this whole quarantine is experiment with different types of carb sources to see what works for me. And, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm always, ha I always promote the, the Gerber, the, the cream of rice, yeah. the Gerber brand that right there, I did a video the other day and I'm eating 90 grams of carbs pre and post workout coming from the Gerber. If I were to eat 90 grams of carbs coming from rice or potatoes or anything like that, I'd be in probably in a food coma on the couch. I wouldn't be able to train, you know, for me, that would be, that would be a lot. So it's, it's all about finding the foods that work for you and see the, what, how digestion feels when you do eat them. And, uh, and yeah, and, and you know, that, that helps you actually keep that stomach down. But back to the, the other part where you said about insulin and growth hormone, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's part. I feel like it's part of the game, but you can't you can't overdo it. You can't overdo it. You got to find that sweet spot. You perhaps just found uh, another, you know, uh, name of the uh, another kind of diet. Uh, this one won't be fat as well. I mean, uh, at least because uh, you know it was if it fits your macro and this uh, the the one you uh, you said it's uh, D Y F U. Does it fit you? So <laughs> there you go. You need to brand That's it. That's the new Paragon diet. <laughs> the new one. Yeah. Do you coach people, by the way? I do. I do. A very select few. You know, um, I, I screen the people to make sure that I'm not wasting my time kind of thing. You know, I know a lot of coaches, they, whoever pays them, they service them. But I, I like to work with people that actually are, they, they want to know. They want to learn. They, they don't want to... I tell them something and then they ask 12 other people, you know, and it's like, there's a, always a method to the madness when it comes to coaching sometimes. And it isn't to the end that you see the big picture, but, uh, but very select. I, I used to do it full time before Paragon. And then once Paragon started, you know, growing, uh, I just, you know, I just have a small group. Uh, you took third place in a 212 with a really uh, competitive lineup. Then you went back to the classic. You took yeah. top five in Arnold <laughs> in the classic. So it's really, really impressive. What made you come back to the 212? Um, just that I, knew, I saw that it was getting increasingly hard to make weight and I was very miserable uh, dieting. I was very, very miserable. And I had such a great time. That whole experience doing 212 at the Europa was such a great time. I mean, uh, it was, it was in Dallas. That's where my coach lives. So I got to spend the weekend with him and I never felt at any time that I was, I was suffering at all. I was in, I was in great condition. And you know, when he said, all right, let's, let's start, you know, eating some carbs here and there. It was, it was like three days out of the show and I'm not used to that. I'm used to eating, you know, starting to eat after I make weight, which is like 12 hours before I'm supposed to be on stage. So it, it just made me very relaxed and it, it just made the experience that much better. Um, the only reason why I went from 212, I did 212 last year back to classic this year was because uh, the Arnold, um, it was invitation only. So I'm like, okay, so it's invitation only. Let me submit my, my you know, my, uh, my uh, whatever, my paperwork that they needed to see, to see if I get accepted. And if I do, I'll do it. And then I got accepted. So I'm like, well, I guess I, I don't have a choice. I'm going to do it now. So that was basically the only reason, but I always had in my mind that I wanted to go back to 212. But it was really, really competitive lineup. You know, Ruff Diesel uh, was uh, the uh, Steve Laurie, Alex, Alex <laughs> Campanario. Mm -hmm. so, Steve Laureus. Yeah. I don't remember the fourth guy. Sorry for uh, you had um, uh, Abner, uh, Abner Logan, and you had um, uh, what's uh, he's gonna kill me when he, if he sees this? He's I forget his name. Uh, Ricky, Ricky Moan. Yeah, uh, all yeah. incredible guys. When talking about the Logans, uh, there is a Logan uh, uh, that is that came from the men's physique. He's uh, really making a nice Logan progress. Franklin. Logan Franklin. Uh, what do you think about his progress when it comes to the classic? I mean, he's, he has the classic look. Yeah. You know, he has a classic look. He has a great, uh, a great coach behind him with AJ Sims. Um, I'm not – he's the last person that I would expect that would come out of shape yeah. due to the fact that he's always in shape and he has a coach that is known for getting all his clients peeled. So it, it's just a matter of showing up and seeing who's in the show to try to beat him. Um, that's, that's basically it. I think, I think that the only, the only way that somebody would beat him is if somebody like from the top five of the Arnold or the top five of the, um, of the Olympia shows up at that show. And then he's going to have some problems just because, you know, he, he's rather new to the class. I feel like he has to work his way up. They're not, they're not just if like, let's say I'll give you an example. Like, let's say, Somebody like Terrence Ruffin shows up at that show, he's gonna he's gonna beat Logan. Like that's it's just the fact. But I think that over time he's gonna be very difficult to beat just because 
he's putting on the size and he has the height. And we go back to the height in classic. He's like right in that in that sweet spot. Uh, when speaking about carving up, uh, two, two, you, saw, you said that you had, for example, 12 hours to carve up. It's really tricky and really dangerous not to, you know, not to get the standard on the stage when you have just 12 hours. How do you, how do you carve up? I mean, like you, I, I don't want to have like yeah. overall because it's always depend, uh, depends on the person. But how do you do it? Well, that's always, that's always been increasingly difficult. And, and still to this day, we haven't been able to figure it out. Uh, for classic, for classic, um, we have to go into the weigh-in very, very, very depleted, very dehydrated. Sometimes we wouldn't even eat for maybe 10 hours before the weigh-in to try to make weight. Still would have to do cardio to pull water that day. So a lot of extremes that stress out the body. And therefore, when you start introducing food, things are happening that you just were not ready for. Um, And that, that, was the, that was the problem is, is once you're that dry and that depleted, if you in start introducing food without water, it's going to cause issues with your stomach. I mean, not, not, being able, not being properly hydrated prior to eating carbohydrates, it's going to not only make you flat, and it's also going to ruin your stomach. So we always had, this, we always had struggles with it because one of the first things on me that in those scenarios that we would start, you know, uh, filling out is my obliques. And in classic, you don't want that to happen. You want everything else to get big. You just don't want the obliques to start, to start pulling. The water starts pulling in that area. So that was one struggle that we had to, had to go through many times and also not getting enough food so that my legs felt like they were granite again. They always felt like they were always hard to flex on me. Um, and, you know, you could, it could be a result from uh, carbohydrates. It could be a result from water, sodium as well. It's just a lot of factors. When we did 212, it was like, it was just perfect. We were drinking water all the way in through weigh-in. Uh, I didn't even have to take off any of my clothes. I weighed in with all my clothes on, fully carved up, fully, fully hydrated, two gallons the day before pre-judging. And then it was just drying out like normal, you know, like a normal routine, dry out through the middle of the night. And that, that was it. Uh, no need for, for diuretics or anything for that to try to make weight. So I was able to keep a, a nice fullness just because we didn't have to, we didn't have to drop a diuretic, but you have so many, we had so many variables when it dealt with carving up for classic that it was different every single show, every single time it was completely different depending on how extreme we had to go to make weight. So I think that the formula for, uh, for 212 is going to be much easier. It's like, you look good. All right, let's control water a little bit. Let's start adding a little bit of food, more fats. We, we like to use fats a lot in our carb up process or the filling out process. We like to use fats a lot and, uh, and we keep protein very small. And that's about it. It's, a, it's very simple. It doesn't get too crazy. Uh, protein, protein is kept small, just not to bother your stomach. Yeah. So what we do is, is instead of adding, like some people like to do, add the peanut butter and stuff, you know, we, we just get the fats from the protein. So instead of adding more food in there, we'll just say, okay, let's do four ounces of steak. So like a ribeye, that's very fatty. We do the four ounces of ribeye and then we'll probably do like 50 grams of carbs with that. And that'll be it. Instead of doing like pr some protein, some carbs, and then we'll throw a tablespoon of peanut butter. Too many things. We just keep it as simple as possible. Uh, when speaking about carving up, uh, you hear for uh, surely uh, that people are taking up to like, you know, thousand carbs for a few days and they weigh like 80 kilos. So it's like 180, 190, something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that their body is even able to digest and I mean, not even digest, but take uh, the, do, does their body need that much of glycogen? Um, you know, it, it really just depends. I know that, I know that some people, some people I've seen that, that do these very high carb days and then they'll lose weight the next day. Uh, I'm not like that at all. I'm not like that at all. I, I change anything on my diet and I gain five pounds automatically. So it's very risky unless you've done it before. Like, 
you know, if we, if you look back at, at somebody like Skip Hill, Skip Hill um, has those skip load days that he does with his clients where they're eating a tremendous amount of carbs, but they do it every single week. So they know what's going to happen. I personally would not just tell my client, okay, go so for the carb up, we're going to do a thousand grams of carbs. I don't know where, I don't know how it's going to affect you or anything like that. I think that you would have to experiment with that many times before. We also have to take into consideration that when somebody eats that much, their metabolism is going to shoot out, shoot through the roof. So making sure that you're keeping those, that your body's still holding on to those calories is also very important. So it's case by case. I don't, I think that more people just fantasize that they are able to do these crazy carb ups, but in reality, you really don't. I mean, uh, for the 212 show that we did last year, in the course of three days leading into the show, we probably ate maybe 300 grams of carbs per day, you know, and we were still, I was still training. I, I, I made it almost like a, a regular, regular day, as regular as possible. Just increased fats just a little bit and controlled water just a little bit. But other than that, it wasn't anything too crazy. Yeah, same, uh, same happened to Fuad. He spoke uh, once about it that uh, when they changed ba barely nothing uh, coming to the show, he looked the best. And all he did for the carb up was like 400 carbs at the day previous to the show. Yeah, yeah. It, it really doesn't. It, and again, it, it just depends on how depleted you are. It really depends. Because I think, I think that some people could also benefit from, you know, using insulin. Uh, during a carb up, you know, if they know what they're, if they actually know what they're doing, um, you know, it's a tool that, that can be utilized very effectively. Um, but it's something that you have to have practice before. It's just something that you just cannot just show up all the work that you've done 16 weeks, 20 weeks, and then you're going to ruin it by experimenting the last day of the leading into a show. This is something that you have to test throughout the prep to make sure that you know what you're doing. Uh, how hard those are two last questions uh because i don't want to take too much of your time uh how hard are you going to party pre, uh, post show <laughs> because i know that you're uh, famous for, for partying post show so. well well tamp i i think that for the most part everything's still going to be shut down uh here you know all the all the clubs and everything are probably still going to be shut down i do know that in in tampa they have a a, a theme park called Bush Gardens. So I promised my girlfriend that I'd take her there to ride the roller coasters and stuff after the show. Um, I do have more shows after Tampa, so I can't, I can't party too hard, but you better believe that when I get back to Miami after Tampa, I'm probably going to hit a strip club. <laughs> Staying in the 212 in those? Uh, yes, in the 212 the whole, whole way. So it'd be Tampa, it'd be Puerto Rico, It'd be New York and then possibly Boston. Yeah, and coming to the last question, what's the goal for Santi this year uh, when it comes to the competing and when it comes to the uh, personal life or whatever? 100% is, I've always, even in, when I did the Europa, Dallas, it was first call out. That's always my goal in, in at least for now in 212 because I know that I, I still am undersized. Mm -hmm. I'm still that fresh, fresh, face in the lineup. So I think that just going in saying, Hey, it's a win for me. If I can get first call out, I'm super happy with that. And wherever, you know, things fall is a bonus after that. Um, that would be realistic. That would be a realistic uh, goal to try to achieve going into each show. Um, as far as in the future, I mean, I'd love to qualify for the Olympia at some point so I can retire I already was able to do the Arnold and I think the Olympia, you know, within the next five years, at least qualify once for the Olympia. I think that that, that for me, I, I'll feel like I, I've, I'm, I'm happy with, with my bodybuilding career. Um, as far as business goes this year, I mean, I have the version four of the waist trainer coming out and then we also spoke about the cream. So hopefully by the Olympia time, which is in December now, we're able to release this to the public. Yeah, so down there, I'm going to link uh, all of your social media and uh, site because you've got the site for the waist trainer and so on. And thank you very much for your time. 
and for having a really nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Peace, everybody. Have a good one.